Today I'm going to talk about capacitors. Capacitance is the property of storing energy as electricity under pressure. Now I'm sure there's some engineers out there saying, what did that guy just say? Uh, we know that a capacitor stores energy in an electric field. Well, I'm talking about how a capacitor acts. I'm going to sacrifice accuracy a little bit to give us insight into how a capacitor acts rather than being totally accurate in what it actually does. So what does a capacitor actually do? Well, what we have are two conductors, and I'll show the symbol for a capacitor, which is two straight lines that are separated by some insulation. Some people call that the dielectric. That's a fancy word for insulation. We'll have a couple of wires come to connect to those two pieces of metal. And in the capacitor, it's often as not those pieces of metal or flat pieces of metal that are adjacent to each other, like in a ceramic capacitor. Sometimes it might be a metal coated plastic that's rolled around, like two layers rolled around each other. But whatever we have, we have two conductors separated by an insulator. And when we pour electricity into one of these, here's our conventional current going in there, that electricity is going to pile up. I'll show those little positives. Positive charge starts piling up there, and that tends to drive electricity off the other end. If I want to be more accurate, of course, the electricity is going the opposite direction. I pile up negative charge here, which shoves electrons off the other side, which causes a positive charge on the other side. But as in most of academia and the electronics industry, we're talking the conventional current. So our charge piles up here and drives charge off the other side. So interesting thing happens with a capacitor. It looks like it conducts electricity, doesn't it? But it doesn't do it forever because as this electricity piles up on this side, as electrons are piling up here and driving electrons off the other side, they push back with voltage. And so the more electricity I put up here, the more voltage pushes back. And eventually, if the voltage pushing back, let's see, I, well, let's uh, turn this around into a circuit. So here's a battery. I'll put a resistor in there just to control the flow. Put a capacitor here. And just for practicality, I'll draw a switch in here. So let's say this is a 10 volt battery. I throw this switch and electricity starts to come in and pile on this side. That pushes electricity off the other side. It looks like a short circuit, doesn't it? But of course that electricity piles up and starts pushing back. And let's say this pushes back, it gets up to maybe five volts. Well, now that current is going to slow down a little bit. So we're not going to have as much current going through. And eventually this is going to get up to 10 volts and it's pushing back as hard as this is pushing there. Now it looks like a battery. I'm redrawing it now. Looks like we have a, another 10 volt battery eventually. It's pushing that way as hard as this one's pushing that way and we have no current. So by this time, the capacitor looks like exactly what it is, which is an insulator. So that's a, a quick insight into what capacitors do. So what I've done is I've pushed energy in. While I was doing that, energy was going right through it. Electricity came in one side, was pushed off the other side by the electric field in between, and now I've got a storage of lots of electricity on here, positive charge on that side, negative charge on that side, and it's going to equal my battery voltage. Now this battery and this capacitor act like something else that we often use every day. Let's erase that and let's replace the battery with an air compressor. And that air compressor is going to go to an air tank. And we're going to turn on that compressor, it's going to start rotating, and it's going to start pushing air into that air tank. Let's say this air compressor can push up to 100 pounds per square inch. Well, when we first start putting air into this tank, what's the pressure inside there? It's zero pounds per square inch. So there's no pressure inside the air tank pushing back, and so the air freely goes into the tank. But of course, what happens as time goes by, air starts to build up in here and starts to build pressure and starts to push back. And after a while, it might be pushing back with 50 pounds per square inch. 
And so now the air is going to be going in slower because it's being pushed back. And eventually it's going to get up to the pressure of the pump, which is going to be 100 PSI. And when that happens, the tank is pushing back as hard as the compressor is pushing this way and no air goes any way and the tank is completely full. So now that we've got this tank full of air under pressure, what can we do with it? Well, we can put another little uh, valve up here, perhaps, in a something like, how about an air wrench? An air tool of some sort, and we can use that to power that air tool or some other device, like air brakes or who knows what. So we can use this energy to do some work. And of course, what's going to happen is as we use that up, the pressure is going to drop in here. And eventually that will, if we keep using it long enough without turning the pump back on, we're going to drain this back down to zero pounds per square inch. Does the battery do something similar? You bet you it does. So let's draw that circuit again. A little resistance, a switch, and our capacitor. So we close the switch. So let's make this 10 volts again. And the current starts to go into the battery, piles up here, and starts pushing back. But of course, as it piles up here, it pushes electricity off the other side. At first, it makes a circuit. But eventually, this fills up, if you will, to 10 volts. Now it's pushing back just as hard. Let's open the switch now just to disconnect it from the battery. And I can use this for virtually anything I can do with a battery. I can put a light bulb across here. And let's put a switch here just for controlling it. And I close this switch and that light bulb is gonna light up for a very short time because I can only store so much energy in this capacitor. So I can fill it up with the battery and then I can use it. Um, if I can find some circuit that needs very little current, I can make it last a little longer. But of course, a light bulb is going to use a lot of current and it's going to discharge that capacitor very quickly. So is there anything I can do to increase the capacity of this capacitor? Hmm. Capacity, capacitor. wonder where they got its name from. Yes, if you increase the size of the plates or put them closer together and also it can have a little bit to do with the insulating material but not as much it mostly depends on the material it's made out of but if i increase the surface area of the plates or get them closer together do either one it's going to increase the amount of electricity it takes to fill this up so it's going to take more electricity to get that up to the 10 volts and then i have more electricity to use up. One place you might see this, some of you might be familiar with this, and that is with uh, uh, cars that have very powerful sound systems in them. You've heard them, you know, the cars with the big booming bass as they go by. Problem with that is that the electrical system of the car has too much resistance, too much impedance. The output impedance from the battery and the car system running the sound system is just too high. And so what happens is as the sound comes out, that big booming sound takes a lot of energy, pulls a lot of current, and what happens? We get a voltage drop. Remember our talk about Thevenin's theorem and input and output impedance? This impedance goes from high to low to high to low. When it goes to a low impedance, it pulls a lot of current. What does that do? It pulls down this voltage. So the car is going down the road, and every time the the drum goes boom, the lights dim down. Boom, 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 boom. You can't have that. So what do they do? They get a huge, huge capacitor. Not necessarily physically huge. They might be, though, maybe about as a little bigger than this these days. But you know, a few years ago, they used to be much bigger. But they've learned to make bigger capacity and smaller physical capacitors. But they put a big, huge capacitor out here. And between booms, that stores up energy. It's sort of like the air compressor filling up the air tank, and then you use the gun and it can take the air out, and then you can refill it later. But what that does is, one, is that the battery, the, the capacitor has a very low output impedance. So it fills up, and then when that sound system gives our big boom, it's able to suck energy from the capacitor without the 
voltage drop of the energy coming directly from the batteries. In a previous video, I talked about does a radio take more current when we turn up the volume? And yes, it does. And these booms do the same thing. And so between the booms, between the sounds, we don't have much current flowing, so the capacitor fills up. And then when it does boom, it can suck that energy out of the capacitor, which has a lower output impedance than the battery and the rest of the circuitry, so it can handle that without the voltage dropping down. So there we see what a capacitor does. It stores energy under pressure, just like an air tank stores energy as air under pressure. A capacitor stores energy as electricity under pressure, and it's a very similar mechanism as far as the way it works. Now, of course, uh, the actual mechanism of a capacitor is different from a storage tank, but it works pretty much the same. We use capacitors again and again in a ways that we would use a air storage tank. Another example of, um, of a similar operation is controlling the flow of a big river. Let's say we have the Mississippi River flowing down here. And what happens? Every year we get the spring rains and the river tends to flood. So what they do is they leave areas around the river that the river can overflow into. So when it tries to flood, instead of flooding, it overflows into these. So these fill up with water and then when the level of the river drops, then the water can flow back, just like that capacitor that can take energy from the battery between the booms. This is a little bit reverse of that, but when the water level gets too high, which is the same as the voltage getting too high, remember voltage and altitude are both potential energy. When the level of the river gets too high, it overflows, so instead of getting higher, the water flows into these basins, and then when the river drops down, the water goes from the basin back into the river. And so these uh, reservoirs can help control the flow of a river, and they work just like a capacitor. So let's take a look at how capacitors work a little bit again. They are two bits of metal separated by insulator, so two conductors separated by an insulator. So if I hold up these two wires, here's a conductor, there's another conductor, and there's insulation between them. Are they acting like a capacitor? Yes, they are. I have a capacitor in my hands. Uh, not a whole lot of capacity or capacitance because there's very little metal and they're very far apart. If I move them closer together, they have more capacitance but I need more metal to get a lot of more capacitance. But any time you have two conductors separated by an insulator, you have a capacitor. And when we talk about AC circuits, we'll find that when we get to high frequencies, even this can make a big difference. You can get a lot of, uh, of, of a reaction out of a small capacitor at high frequencies. In fact, having parallel wires at high frequencies can be a blessing or a curse. If you want them to couple across to each other, have energy go from one side to the other, that's good, but often you don't, and that causes all sorts of problems in alternating current circuits, such as oscillators and radios and stuff. And you may have, have to take measures to keep lines, wires from being too close to each other, and especially being parallel, where you get a lot of wire adjacent to each other. So anytime you have two conductors separated by insulation, you have a capacitor. Now what affects the capacitance? Well, if we double the surface area, we double the capacitance. If we move them close together, if we move them closer together, we get more capacitance. So to increase your capacitance, you either increase the surface area or you put them closer together. There are types of capacitors that are made in such a way that they're made out of materials that are chosen just because they have these two properties. One, a lot of surface area, and you can get the conductors very close to each other. So more surface area or closer together, you get more capacitance. And capacitance is like making a bigger air tank. So more capacitance is like a bigger tank. You can store more energy in that. So how do we quantify the amount of capacitance we have? We have a unit called the farad, named in honor of Michael Faraday, a great scientist of the 19th century who is credited with discovering mutual induction. And so we named the unit of capacitance after Michael Faraday. And one farad, represented by the letter F, so one farad, 
if we have a capacitor and we put in 6, 2, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. That many electrons. So an electron carries one elemental charge, and if we put six quintillion, 240 quadrillion electrons, approximately, into that capacitor, and we find that after putting that many electrons in there, we have one volt across the electrodes of that capacitor, we have, drum roll please, a one farad capacitor. Now there's a special name for this number of electrons or number of elemental charges, which is called the Coulomb. So a Coulomb is a quantity of electricity, you can, something like you can hold in your hands. I have 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons in my hand, therefore I have one Coulomb of charge. So that's how we measure what a farad is. That's how we quantify what it is. So if we have a capacitor and the size of that capacitor is such that when we stuff one Coulomb of charge in there, we get one volt across it, we have a one farad capacitor. Now it used to be that to get a farad of capacitance, we had to have a pretty physically big capacitor to do that because what do we have to do? We have to have lots of surface area and we can only get the plates so close to each other. So we were limited in how well we can make these and a one farad capacitor would be about the size of a one liter bottle. But today we are able to make capacitors with uh, newer types of materials and we have what are called super capacitors and now you can get one farad capacitors that are you know, smaller than your, the tip of your thumb. Of course they uh, can't hold a huge amount of voltage, just a, you know, two, three, five volts or so, because the closer we get those plates together, which is what they do, they have materials that can get the, the uh, uh, conducting surfaces very, very close to each other, the closer you get, the easier it is to break down from voltage. So we get huge, huge uh, capacitances in the small space, but they can't take much voltage. So to have a capacitor that both has a high capacitance and can take a high voltage, you have to get bigger and bigger the more voltage you want to be able to take. So let's take a look at these properties again. A capacitor is two conductors separated by an insulator. There's our leads going to it. And this is the symbol for a capacitor, two parallel lines with two perpendicular lines going away from them. And if we make those bigger, make the adjacent area bigger, we get more capacitance. Or if we move them closer together, we get more capacitance. But there's also a property of how much voltage they can handle. And the closer together they are, the less voltage they can handle. So to get both high capacitance and high voltage capability, we need to have a physically bigger capacitor because to handle more voltage, we have to move those plates apart. And therefore, to get more capacitance, we have to get the area of the plates to be larger. Now, since capacitors that would hold a ferret of capacitance would be physically big, especially if you need to be able to handle some voltage, we typically don't work with very big capacitances. And so typically, capacitors will be in the range of microfarads, or one millionths of a farad. So a typical capacitor might be, let's say, 10 microfarads. So we have the Greek letter mu that represents the micro, or one millionth, and the farad. So that's not an untypical size of a capacitor. They're usually measured in microfarads. And a funny thing about capacitors, this isn't true all over the world, but in America at least, we never specify capacitance in millifarads. So uh, although I've heard of this used, you know, like a, maybe a 10 millifarad capacitor, I've never actually seen one labeled that way. I've heard the term used uh, usually by uh, people outside of America, but uh, if you buy a capacitor, 
a 10 millifarad capacitor, which, how much capacitance is that? Well, milli, that's going to be, uh, if we put a decimal point here, that's going to be, um, there's our three places. So zero, that would be millifarads, that would be tens of millifarads. So actually what we would have is point, point zero 0.01 farads equals 10 millifarads. Uh, to review this, watch the video on prefixes, which I have linked down below, and I'll try to link it up there too. And so 10 millifarads is 0 0.010 farads, but we would not usually see them specified that way because manufacturers usually specify capacitors in microfarads, even if we have thousands of microfarads. So what would this be? Well, 0 0.010000. If we were using microfarads, our most significant digit would be down in here. So if our most significant digit is here, we're in thousands of microfarads, and over here we're in tens of thousands. So actually, a 10 millifarad capacitor would be labeled as 10,000 microfarads. So that's just a convention of the industry. You might hear people talk about millifarads, but usually you would have millifarads labeled as thousands of microfarads. So 10 millifarads would be labeled as 10,000 microfarads. Another thing that's very common is the fact that a lot of uh, companies labeling machines can't handle Greek alphabet. So what's the closest Latin letter to uh, the Greek letter mu? That would be the letter U. So a lot of times you might see a capacitor labeled as, well, instead of 10,000 mu farads, you might see 10,000 U farads. So a 10,000 UF capacitor, that U means micro, so that's a 10,000 microfarad capacitor. Sometimes that might be a lowercase, as often as not it's an uppercase. So they use the, the Latin letter U instead of the Greek letter mu to represent micro. So here's an example here of a capacitor, and it, you can't see it there, so I'll put a little close-up in the corner there. And it says 2200 mu F. So what do we have? 2200 mu F. So that's a 2200 microfarad capacitor, or 2.2 millifarads. I don't usually use millifarads, but you might hear people say that. So 2200 microfarad capacitor. It also says that it is 25 volts. So you don't want to exceed that voltage because then the capacitor will break down. And just like an air tank, if you put air into a tank, if you put a little air in, you get a little pressure. You put more air in, you get more pressure. You put more air in, you get more pressure. And you can keep doing that until one of two things happens. Either your air compressor can't push any more, or the tank explodes. Well, how about a capacitor? Well, you put a little bit of electricity in, you get a little voltage. You put more in, you get more voltage. Remember, voltage is electrical pressure. You put in more electricity, you get more voltage. And you keep doing that, you get more and more voltage until one of two things happens. Either your voltage source doesn't have enough voltage to push anymore, your voltage source equals the voltage in the capacitor, so they're pushing the same amount each direction, and you can't push in anymore, or the capacitor breaks down, and capacitors can and do explode. So very similar to an air tank in that capacity also. So this tells me how much voltage this capacitor is rated to handle. You can probably expect it to handle about half again as much, but you don't want to exceed the rated voltage. So uh, this particular capacitor can only handle 25 volts. So if I want more voltage, I'll have to get a, probably a physically larger capacitor. They'll put the plates a little further apart to get a higher voltage capacity. For example, here's another capacitor, which is about physically almost exactly the same size. But if you look at the close-up there, we see that it is, we see 0.47. We'll talk about that labeling in just a moment. Plus or minus 10%, 600 volts. So this is only 0.47 microfarads, or if we look at this, that's uh, 10,000 microfarads compared to 0.47 with the decimal point there, 0.47 microfarads. So it's a much smaller capacitor, but you can see that the, it's, it's smaller 
because let me just do a little quick drawing here to give you an idea of what's going on here. The one capacitor has a lot of plate area and they're very close to each other. So we get 10,000 microfarads at 25 volts. This one, we have less plate area and they're further apart. So we have less capacitance, 0.47 microfarads. Notice that the microfarads are not labeled on this one. It just says 0.47. You have to know what it means. 0.47 microfarads at 600 volts. So even if the plates were the same size, and maybe they are, very well could be the same size, but they're further apart. So that's 0.47 microfarads. And because the plates are further apart, it can handle 600. Let's just write that right up here. 600 volts. So same plate area, further apart, less capacity, but more voltage. So that's another uh, type of thing we need to know about capacitors. Now sometimes, in fact, quite frequently, capacitors have quite small capacities. And so we were just showing a 10,000 microfarad capacitor and a 0.47 microfarad capacitor, which is equal to 470 nanofarads. So notice that instead of using 470 nanofarads, the manufacturer used 0.47 microfarads. Again, just as millifarads are very rarely, if ever, used to label capacitors, nanofarads are very rarely, if ever, used to label capacitors also. People may talk about nanofarads, but I've never seen a capacitor labeled as nanofarads. Might see it in a schematic, but I've never seen one on a label. So 0.47 microfarads is equal to 470 nanofarads. What happens if we get even smaller? How about 0.000? Three, three microfarads, which would be equal to 0 0.000000000033 farads. What do we have there? Milli, micro, nano, pico. So those are picofarads. So this capacitor, just for good measure, put the leading zero there. Uh, so this capacitor with 0 0.000000033 farads is equal to 33 or 330 pico farads. Now, if you see some schematics that were made maybe around in the 1960s or earlier, in fact, you might even find some really, really old capacitors that might be labeled this way. Sometimes, before the term pico came into use in the scientific community, they would say, well, that is one millionth of one millionth. So this 330 picofarad capacitor would have been labeled as a 330 micro micro farad. So this is something that hasn't been used in quite a few years, but you still might find it here and there. So a micro micro farad, a one millionth of one millionth of a farad, micro micro farad, today would be called a picofarad. And so Capacitors tend to be labeled in microfarads or picofarads. And if they're really, really big, they might be labeled as farads. I don't think I've ever seen a capacitor labeled as one million microfarads, which would be one farad. But I wouldn't be surprised if I found an older capacitor labeled that way. But I have seen one farad capacitors labeled as one farad or two farads. Some of these really big capacitors, like I told you they use in the sound systems, might be one or two farads in capacity. So you might see farads, microfarads, or picofarads. In schematics and people talking, you might also hear about nanofarads and millifarads, but on the labels you'll see picofarads, microfarads, or farads. Now the labeling on your capacitors is often very straightforward, as I showed you. That blue capacitor was simply labeled as 10,000 microfarads. Could have been called 10 millifarads, but we usually don't do that. 10,000 microfarads, pretty straightforward. The other one just said 0.47. So what do I know about that? Well, if the capacitance has a decimal point and then a number, that tells me it is microfarads.
So 0.47 tells me it's 0.47 microfarads. What if I don't see the point? If I just see a 47, that would be picofarads. So that's how we can tell on the capacitors that are labeled that way. So a capacitor labeled 0 0.033 is equal to 0 0.033 microfarads, but a capacitor labeled as 33 is equal to 33 picofarads, which of course is is 0 0.00000000033 farads. Anyway, that's how those might be labeled. You also might see capacitors labeled something like this. What's that tell us? Well, that's sort of like reading the resistor color code in a way. This is telling me that I need to read it in picofarads. So that would be one zero and three zeros. So that would be one, or actually 10,000 picofarads, which is also the same as 0 0.01 microfarads. So it's just another way capacitors might be labeled. You might also see after the capacitance, you might see a letter such as J, K, or M. That tells us the tolerance of the capacitor. J is equal to 5%, K is equal to 10%, and M is equal to 20% if you see those on the capacitor. So capacitors are labeled in different ways. As a matter of fact, if you go way back, you might find mica capacitors that look like little dominoes with little color spots on them. And those are read somewhat like the resistor color code. Uh, I'm not going to go through that one because those are exceedingly rare these days. You might go into an old surplus store and find some old mica capacitors, but those things had looked like little dominoes, six little dots, and you had to read the capacitance from the colors on those dots. Glad we don't have to do that anymore. But anyway, different ways they're labeled. Sometimes it's straightforward, just number of microfarads. Sometimes a decimal point and number of microfarads. That would be 0.33 microfarads, or no decimal point, which is the number of picofarads. So 1,000 microfarads, 0.33 microfarads, 33 picofarads. Might also be labeled such as that as a number plus a number of zeros. So that would be 10 plus three zeros, or 10,000 picofarads. And the tolerance might be listed as a J, K, or an M. So that's your capacitor basics. In the next video, I will talk about types of capacitors. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible, and a big thank you to everyone for watching.